Hi everyone, this is Siddha and you're watching Tech for Luddites. Now, I've noticed you guys tend to like videos about energy and satellites. So this video has both. Satellites that beam solar energy down to Earth. The Sun, for all intents and purposes, is a perpetual source of energy. It possesses a gross incandescence that other energy sources can only aspire to. But by the time it gets to the surface of our planet, it has already been filtered by several kilometers of atmosphere and is subject to that pesky day and night cycle. So as they do, scientists wondered if they could somehow get closer to the source in order to collect some freshly brewed photons straight from the core of the Sun. After studying the matter seriously in the 70s and 80s, NASA concluded that the whole enterprise was too expensive, needed technologies that were untested and was better left in the realm of science fiction and action movies. But 40 or so years later, the calculus has changed. With the privatization of the space industry, several companies, most notably Elon Musk's SpaceX, have been able to drive down the cost of sending things up into space. And with this, we can finally look forward to gigantic solar collectors beaming down energy to power our cities. Infinite wireless electricity for the whole world, just as Tesla dreamed. But before we open our arms and look to the heavens for free, unlimited energy, Let's dig into the details of how it'll work and how much it'll cost. Stuff a satellite with solar panels inside, launch it way above the Earth into the geosynchronous orbit where it's always illuminated by the Sun and you're already halfway there. Next, you have to convert the electrical energy from the solar panels into microwaves. Because as cool as visible lasers look, they dissipate a lot of energy into the atmosphere. Now. I've done quite a bit of work with microwaves, especially in the past few months. So as an expert, I'm happy to tell you that we can convert electricity into microwaves and vice versa with about 70% efficiency. So that's pretty decent considering that in orbit, you have the benefit of 24 hours of uninterrupted sunlight instead of six and at five to 10 times the intensity we get on the surface of the Earth. There are also designs that use giant mirrors to focus sunlight onto the solar panels while objectively better in terms of efficiency. These require a little more effort to keep the satellite and the mirrors flying in the right configuration. Though satellites already seem to be pretty good at that, the ground stations receiving these microwaves will need to be pretty large. Called rectennas, a portmanteau of rectifier and antenna, large arrays of these will convert the incoming microwaves into electricity. If you stood right in the middle of the beam, the energy you'd receive would be two orders of magnitude above the recommended dose for humans though still a bit lower than the typical solar irradiance on a sunlit day. The stations will emit a pilot signal for the energy satellite to lock onto, so that they don't fry entire neighborhoods by mistake. But there will be concerns about what happens to birds that fly through the beam. Delicious concerns. No, don't worry. The energy is nowhere close to doing that. Now, some of the more pragmatic amongst you would be saying, that's all very well, but let's get down to business. How much does it cost? Well, I don't have the most solid grasp on these numbers, but this is what solar power costs here on Earth. And here is what we can currently manage in space. That doesn't really look like a difference that can be made up by economies of scale or incremental technological improvements, especially because we're already nearing the limits of how efficient we can make solar panels. And even though they may last longer in space due to less wear and tear, I doubt it'll come anywhere close to making up the difference. So just how implausible is this technology? Even the granddaddy of overambitious and unlikely projects believes it's a step too far. Elon Musk says, electron to photon converters are not free, nor is sending stuff to space. So then it obviously super doesn't work. Though agencies like the Japanese and the Chinese space programs that are not strictly constrained by a profit motive are a little more optimistic. They're forging ahead with plans to launch space-based solar projects in the next two decades. The Japanese plan to have a one gigawatt power generating unit in space by 2031. And the Chinese are developing a 250 megawatt project on a similar schedule. But of course, when you really need research money, you go to the military. No price is too high for innovative new ways to melt steel. The Navy is getting in on the action. And to that end, a secret research plane took off recently in order to try and see if they can generate a beam of microwaves from solar energy. We already kind of know we can do that, but maybe they're just making sure. There are some trends that may lead to this technology being at least somewhere in our near future. Land becoming more valuable, humanity developing a bigger appetite for space exploration, asteroid mining, and the 5G causes coronavirus dinosaurs finally going extinct. There's also the issue of climate change and air pollution, which this tackles completely, except for all the fuel we'll burn getting the satellites into space. 
and space debris. That's a tough sell, is all I'm saying. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you'd like to go more in depth about space, check out Isaac Arthur on YouTube. I can't recommend him highly enough. As always, like, share, subscribe, and start a conversation below to get more videos like this in your recommendations. I'll see you really soon. Bye.